We live on a one acre farm, smack dab in the middle of Phoenix, Arizona. And today, I'm gonna give you a tour of it. Land is kind of hard to find in Arizona. So when we stumbled across a fixer upper on an acre of land, we snatched it up. We've spent the last 10 years fixing it up, raising animals, growing our own food, and turning it into our own little backyard farm oasis. Let's start with the front yard orchard. So since we live in the middle of like a suburban neighborhood, we couldn't really put raised garden boxes in our front yard. So I decided to turn the front yard into a little orchard and that way it made our neighbors happy and we felt like we were growing something that actually was giving us food. We've got two different varieties of mulberry trees, a Pakistani and a dwarf. We've also got a bunch of stone fruits. We've got two varieties of peaches, an apricot and a plum, an almond tree. We've got three different fig trees. A prickly pear cactus because Arizona. And a bunch of different varieties of grapes. We've also got a blackberry bush. Of course we have citrus as well. And we have plans to plant a lot more. People grow all sorts of things here in the desert. We've tried some tropical trees in the past, but they were a lot of work. But what I've found is that the trees that grow the best are the mulberries and the figs and the grapes. So those are our main <laughs> staple here as far as fruit trees. We had to leave an area open because we have a septic tank here in the front yard and we can't really plant anything above it. But we're taking up as much space as we can in this front area. In the backyard, we've got one of my favorite spaces, the vegetable garden. We've definitely expanded this. We started with just about a thousand square feet. There were about eight different raised garden boxes. And then because Arizona dries out a lot, I found that it was actually pretty hard to grow healthy plants in raised garden boxes. I felt like I was using too much water and I didn't want to waste so much water being here in the desert. So we expanded to the market garden rows where we planted directly into the soil. We have a pretty clay-like soil here, but if you add amendments, it makes the perfect soil for growing here in Arizona. So we've got four market garden rows, and then we've got kind of a mishmash of in-ground and raised garden box growing area. Every place has its different microclimate, which is good because in some places I can grow greens and in some places I can grow the heat-loving fruits like melons or tomatoes. This is the best time of year to show the garden because everything's in bloom. The heat hasn't really kicked in yet. So right now we've got artichokes, zucchinis. We've got two big rows of onions and garlic that are almost ready. I've got some potatoes that are starting, tomatoes that are starting, a bunch of different melons, leftover lettuces from the winter, leftover greens and chard, carrots that are ready to harvest, peppers, and lots of different herbs like sage, rosemary, dill, basil. I'm really happy with this current garden space though. I think I will continue to expand. It's just kind of in my nature. We have one little section that I might expand into. We have an old citrus tree that's run its course, so I think it's time to pull that out and plant some new citrus in that area. I'm trying to debate whether I should raise rabbits in this area or just expand the garden. Let me know what you think. I rewatched my old farm tour from about two years ago where I was talking about how much I wanted a pond and how that would be the ultimate dream of mine. You know, I have plans, you guys. I have big plans to put a pond right here now in this area. Wasn't that a good idea, Doris? And about a year ago, we actually did it. So this pond is a 25 by 35 foot pond. The depth is five feet. Because we live in Arizona, we also had to build a nice big bog to help filter the area. So how it works is bacteria colonizes the bog and the bacteria will actually take the nutrients from the pond and turn it into a usable form of nutrients for the plants. And the plants take those nutrients and use them up. So in a pond, you're always trying to find a way for the nutrients to get utilized. That way you don't have algae growth. So. Our first year was what we expected. We had a lot of algae growth. 
but then this second year we learned the few different things that we should do. So we're excited to experience a second summer with the pond and see what happens. We figured out that you really have to have quite a few plants in the bog and lots of different varieties of plants. That way all the different kinds of nutrients can be used up in different ways and it makes the pond a lot happier. We also got some special fish this year. They're called white emerge fish and these fish are fantastic at cleaning up any extra algae. So if we get any kind of algae bloom in the swimming area, these guys are going to take care of it for us. Let me know if you want to see more information on exactly how this pond works. We'll do a future video on that. When it comes to anything new, it just takes time and it takes experience to learn how to manage it. So we knew we would be going through kind of those learning curves when we started working on the pond, but it has turned into really our absolute favorite thing that we've done here. Directly behind our pond is our pasture. I would say it's roughly about half an acre because it's about half of our property. This is where we let the chickens, pigs, goats, turkeys, lambs roam. We don't have lambs right now this year, but we usually do because they're great at eating up the grass. We got a special breed of pigs to take care of the grass this year, so we're not really needing the lambs. We still have our pecan tree hanging on for dear life in the back corner of the pasture, but the previous owner planted it way too close to the large mulberry tree, so it's always stretching out trying to hit the sun. Before I head back to the animals, it's time to show you guys the two tr subtropical trees I'm still hanging on to. We've got an avocado tree and a banana tree. The banana has fruited, although tiny, <laughs> it has fruited. The avocado tree has not fruited. We've had it a couple years and we are just nurturing it and doing the best we can. We'll see if it does. I have to really quickly show the tree house because this is pretty amazing. This is the first thing Kevin built when we moved to this property. Now that our kids are older, they don't play in it as much, but it's still fun to have when little nieces and nephews come to visit. One of the best things I did this year was revamp my milking station. Those of you that have followed our vlogs know that I'm obsessed with organization and cleanliness. So I really wanted this area to be as clean, as organized as humanly possible. When you're working with goats, they're messy, it's crazy, especially in the morning time when we're milking and everybody's wanting to get in and get their treats. So we tried our best to utilize this little space here that's about halfway back on the property so that we could work fast and get the milking done and everything could stay where it needs to stay. I had a huge feed bin built and it's my favorite thing because it has all the right compartments, everything can be packed away, it's under shade and it's away from the rain so, so far we haven't had any damage to it. I also bought some crates and built a little storage shelf area. And then I also bought bins and used my trusty label maker to label everything and keep everything organized. So, so far it's been pretty good. Everything stayed pretty clean, except this floor gets pretty dirty every once in a while. But I'm really glad that we went with the concrete because our previous floor of pallets was pretty crappy. Right next to our milking station is the chicken coop. This is the thing that I'd really like to redo. It's falling apart, it's hard to get into, it's hard to clean, and it's hard to find the eggs. So I want to make a big walk-in poultry pen with the option for them to still be free-ranged if they want to. So hopefully you guys, this summer, we can build a massive, gorgeous, amazing poultry pen. We've got about 10 different lane hens, and they're all different breeds, all different personalities. They're not super friendly, so we don't usually feature them a ton on the vlog. So we've always had fresh eggs here on the farm, and we don't do much besides feed them and make sure that they're healthy. I really can't talk about poultry without mentioning the turkeys. We've got Kiwi, which is our female adult turkey. She actually laid on some fertile eggs from our male turkey that we had to sell because he was getting a little too aggressive. And she hatched out seven babies for us. One of them passed away to a predator, but now we've got six turkey poults that are running around and growing up big. We're gonna have to decide what to do with those guys as well. This back area is designated for when we need to lock any of the animals up. 
Most of the year, they get to free range and be out in this half acre of pasture, eat what they want, but there's always times in the year, especially when mamas are due with babies, that we need to have an area to lock them up. And that's why we have the goat pen. This area was built so that they had a little mountain to climb, teeter-totter to play on, a little house to get away from the very scant rain that we get here in Arizona. And so it's worked pretty well. We keep a pretty small herd of goats, only seven goats actually. So this area suits us just fine. Let's go meet the goats. Our oldest goat is Penny. She's nine years old and we've had her for about four years. She's given us lots of great babies. In fact, we have one of her daughters, Willow, and they are the most chill, relaxed, best personality goats we've ever had. The next goat is Luna. If you've been following our vlog, you probably really love Luna, but what you don't know about her is she's actually kind of a brat. <laughs> now, she's about ready to be retired, but we still plan on keeping her. She's gonna stay back in our property and eat grass and do all the goat things that she wants. She also produced one of the best babies that we didn't actually plan on, Stella. And Stella is a mix, actually, of Luna's breed, which is a Nubian, and a Nigerian, which is the smaller goat breed. Stella is amazing and a queen, just like her mom. And we're really excited, actually, to see her personality and what kind of babies that she'll produce for us. Though she won't get bred for another year. The next one is Doris. I love my Doris. She's amazing. She's the sweetest goat to milk and has the strong strongest body type, so she has the least health issues and the least problems. Last but not least is Tilly. Tilly is our troublesome, mischievous nightmare of a goat, but we love her too. <laughs> she is the reason why we had to build an extra rail on our goat pen. She is a great milker. This was her first year, but she did reject one of her babies, and so we kept the one that she didn't reject. That's Fern, and they're both great goats, but they're quite naughty, so we have to keep an eye out. In this last area of the animal pens, we've been kind of housing our pigs. Our pigs are pretty new to our farm. We just got them last year, and they're one of Kevin's favorite animals, and they're also one of my least favorite animals. <laughs> pigs are interesting. They're very demanding and very aggressive, but they are pretty cute. These pigs are called Cooney Coonies, which means they originate from New Zealand, and they're more of a pasture-raised pig. They like to eat grass, they like to eat alfalfa, and they're a lot more gentle than a regular pig breed. So they don't really tend to go after our chickens or even our baby chicks. They're pretty mild-mannered. The only thing is, is they mess up this back pen no matter how many times I organize. Cooney Coonies are a meat breed, so they can either be a pet or they can be meat. We're still trying to decide what the end game is for these two guys, but for now, they're pretty good pets for our farm. They also eat all of the leftover waste, so we have absolutely zero waste going on, and it's because of those guys. When we first started on this farm, we tried to do everything ourselves. We even raised our own meat. We had meat chickens and we raised lambs for meat. And the longer we've done this, the more we've kind of changed towards not raising so much of our own meat. Raising meat is a lot of work and we decided to support some local farmers instead these last couple years, which has worked out pretty well for us. So I'm not sure if we're gonna raise a lot of our own meat in the future, although I wouldn't be opposed to raising a bunch of meat chickens again. I think that would be fun. I can't end this without showing you our newest animals on the farm, the kitties. We found some orphan kitties and Lydia's pretty much in heaven, so she's been taking care of these guys and we plan on raising them to live outside and be our little urban farm kitties. Oh, and the kittens have bonded themselves to a lone baby chick that we just were gifted, so. Look forward to some videos on that. All right, that's it guys. That's the entire farm. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it inspires you to do things that you wanna do. I know that I'm always poking around, watching other people's tours, trying to figure out what new project I can think of. So follow along because we plan on building a lot more things and planting a lot more things and raising a lot more things here on the farm.